This podcast is offered through the Sacred Community Project, an inner spiritual collective working to lower the barriers of access to contemplative and devotional practices. Through the universal teachings of love, service, remembrance, and truth, SCP utilizes modern technology to promote eternal values. Learn more at sacredcommunityproject.org. Hey everyone, this is Sita Ram Das, today's host of the SCP podcast. And today I'm interviewing Laura Johnson, who in the community that I live, Laura Johnson is our local, you could say, eco-grief expert. She has her PhD in geography, which I think is a specialty that many of us don't understand. To give it some context, her specialization is in gender, justice, and environmental change. As she put it, Geography was what my PhD was in, cultural geography. My master's was international studies, and that was super interdisciplinary. And I discovered geography through taking some geography courses, not even thinking that they were geography, just being drawn to the topics like global issues and sustainable tourism and things like that, which then led me to geography PhD program. There was this graduate specialization, again, interdisciplinary called gender justice and environmental change. Now teaching, I teach geography, but I also teach environmental studies. And really, I realize that I'm an environmental studies person more than anything else. Right. Yeah. I just think of geography and environmental studies as being like relational frameworks for understanding the Uh world. Yeah. Right. Really, your specialty is in terms of like people and cultures and how they interact with the local environment and vice versa. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Besides being a lecturer at Cal Poly Humboldt, she's also a yoga and mindfulness teacher who places a special emphasis on trauma-informed and social justice practice. And she hosts a monthly eco-grief circle, which is actually what inspired me to reach out to her. Although Laura has been an active leader in our community for a long time, attending the eco-grief circle that she led was my first time experiencing her as a space holder. And I found it quite inspiring, really. She started us off with a grounding practice and then set the ground rules for the container so everyone could feel safe to share. And then the space was opened up for people to express their deep grief and pain for the world. And people cried, people laughed, people found common shared experience. I know that I left feeling a little less alone Because often, usually, grief is something that is a private experience for us. But grief for the world, especially, I've found, there's not much of a social context to share that. If I'm being honest, this kind of grief is in the background of my daily life. And I believe it's in the backdrop for everyone else, too. We just don't talk about it. We know that the world is suffering and that the collective choices we are making, we've made in the past and that we are making right now, are causing this suffering. On top of that, we often feel helpless. We do not know what to do. And it feels ambiguous. It's like this background anxiety that permeates everything. And how many of us have had the experience of sharing our deepest pain, only to have someone say to us, yeah, but great things are happening too, or you just think too much, or be here now, (laughs) right? So we learn to keep it private, and that makes us feel alone in it. And because this is often a subtle thing, right? Like, I don't feel crippling anxiety while shopping at the grocery store. It's more like this little whisper when I look at the plastic wrapping, it knows harm is caused in this purchase. And I feel it. I feel a tinge of that pain in my body, in my being. And then it passes. The grocery clerk asks me how I'm doing, and I say, good. And that's not a lie. But I could also say, I just had a moment of guilt for buying some of the things on my grocery list 
but I don't say that, right? So I say all of this to give some context because being in a space where we can openly talk about the pain we feel in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our bodies, the pain we feel for the world, for collective trauma, systemic oppression, environmental destruction, it wasn't dreary or depressing to be in that space. It didn't feel heavy. It felt cathartic. It was a release. And I experienced true, deep, authentic community connection. I felt less alone. And I could see the lightness on other people's faces too. When we left, there was this feeling of, of freedom. I shared about one of those little moments uh, like the plastic wrap at the grocery store. Uh, but what I shared about was the tinge of guilt that I feel every time when I start my car. Someone else turned to me so spontaneously and exclaimed, me too. And what that left me with, that moment, that simple moment of me sharing something that is a regular part of my experience, but that I don't often talk about, and to have that be validated in a way that it was clear that it was shared by that person in a similar way that it was shared by me. That it's also a really common part of their day and they also don't talk about it, right? So what that left me with for many weeks after and still since, it's, it's been a couple months since I was in that particular group but especially for those first few weeks after, my consciousness was truly tuned in to how universal suffering really is. I would see people passing on the street in other cars or at the grocery store and feel a common humanity with them. Maybe they didn't feel suffering for the exact same things as me, but the universality of suffering, the fact that suffering is deeply present in every person's life that I encounter, that was a felt reality for me, not just a, an intellectual idea, but something that was a true frame of, of reference that I was living in. So due to my own background as a grief counselor, Laura and I share many overlapping frameworks, you could say, but she also has a unique expertise that I don't have. And so for this reason, I thought it would be worthwhile to have a conversation with her about eco grief. And as a part of it, I kind of let loose uh, all of my neurosis, all of my anxieties I feel about climate change and my guilt, confusion, et cetera, is part of the fuel for the conversation. So if you're someone who, like me, cares deeply about the planet, is trying to find their way through this. Hopefully, you find this conversation helpful in some way. I know I did. So, with that background, because you also have this background in grief mm -hmm. um, and yoga, Mm -hmm. Where do both of those fit into that picture? I went to uh, college and my undergrad degree was in journalism. Okay. And I graduated in 2008 and graduating my senior year, I realized I just, I was about to graduate college without having gotten a framework for which to really understand the world and what was happening in it. And I um, had done some traveling and started to have all these questions forming in my mind and so at the very end of my senior year of college, I applied for a graduate program, master's program in international studies, which was interdisciplinary and, and then got accepted. But by that point, I had planned to go up to New York and do an internship in publishing. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm done with school. I'm tired of school. Let sure. me go. Let me work. I did this internship in New York. And then I went and did a year almost a year um, corporate job in DC, working for a government consulting company, which was completely random. So I found myself like in this corporate nine to five job and I felt so trapped and sure. I was just immensely unhappy and really disillusioned. 
And simultaneously, like one of the only things I liked doing at my job was I got the newspaper and I would sit there and read that and drink my coffee or my tea in the morning. And again, just realizing like, wow, there is just these vast social issues over here on the one hand and environmental issues over here on the other hand. Of course, those are related, but I didn't see how they were related. And I knew like, there's got to be some sort of framework. I've got to be able to understand how all these things are connected. Like, why is this all happening? You know, like what's wrong with the world, basically? But I didn't have a framework. And so I'm still like simultaneously unhappy in the corporate world and having all these questions. And so I remembered one day, like I had that grad program that I deferred. Uh -huh. So I, I left DC and went back to North Carolina where I was from and um, did the started an international studies program. And just all my questions started to be slowly answered. And of course, they're still being answered. It's not obviously a yes or no sort of thing. But um, I started to put things together and find the sort of intersectional, deep relational frameworks that I was looking for to understand what was happening. And of course, you know, I was started to understand the cultural assumptions, the roots of everything, right? Um, the, the Western culture, modern culture, the dominant culture, and really getting critical about understanding those assumptions of separation, of supremacy, of oppression. For the first time, I don't know how I was able to go all the way through college without, you know, really understanding capitalism or colonialism sure. or patriarchy, white supremacy, all of these intertwined systems of supremacy and oppression, of fragmentation and separation. So I was, I was feeling really fulfilled in that I was understanding these things now and able to put them together. And of course, simultaneously getting really angry about what I was learning and really overwhelmed. And so that, you know, was really when I first started experiencing ecological grief, but I had no framework for that or had, didn't have any understanding of what that was, or I couldn't have called it that. Uh -huh. So I went and did a PhD program in geography, cultural geography with um, the specialization, gender, justice, and environmental change at Michigan State. Basically, you know, kept, kept delving into these topics. I did research in places like Ghana and West Africa. At the same time, I started to find more of a Buddhist framework. So I started primarily reading Pema Chodron um, uh -huh. as like someone I still return to over and over again, but that she was like my entry point. Um, so I'm, a sim I'm simultaneously sort of uncovering all of these, the stories, the false stories that, you know, um, are shaping the world. And then I start doing sort of this mindfulness self-study and seeing the stories that are shaping, you know, my own um, view of myself and how I show up for the world. And both are really blowing my mind. Sure. Right. <laughs> but really what I realized is that, and only in retrospect do I see it this way, but all of this was happening in my mind, right? Uh -huh. uh, this is so academic. Looking back, I realized we can't only solve these things through our mind, right? Uh -huh. Like I tried really hard to think my way through out of all kinds of things out of, you know, heal through the mind without really realizing how disembodied I was. And that's a cultural thing as well, right? That's another assumption of modern culture is that the mind and the body are separate. The mind is superior to the body that, um, you know, we're this hyper rational culture that, you know, sort of marginalizes emotion. And these are all interconnected to all of our systems of supremacy and oppression, right? So yoga was something I, it was in 2012, I returned from Ghana for a second time. I came back in 2012 and something told me you need to start practicing yoga and you need to start gardening. So uh -huh. yeah, just kind of this like getting into my body, getting into the earth. And I just knew I had to do this. Then I moved down to Humboldt 2016. Okay. Um, and the next year, I did my yoga teacher training at Om Shala here in Arcata. And simultaneously, I was, I was a lecturer at uh, Cal Poly Humboldt in geography and environmental studies. And so I'm kind of, now I have these like two paths and I feel like my foot's in like one in each, you know, but ultimately mm -hmm. they're, they're related ultimately. Um, but it took me a while to kind of figure out how do I merge these different worlds that I felt I was in. Sure. So I, I did my yoga teacher training and then I went on to do my advanced teacher training with Samantha Akers, who is just this is amazing. You know, she's a, a, a Buddhist. And so her training was very much Dharma informed and infused and heart centered. And really what I came to realize is that 
I actually did this um, this training. There's a, a person, Heather Jo Flores, who's she actually used to live in Humboldt. She's the food, not lawns person. If you've ever heard okay. of food, not lawns, sure. like permaculture. Yeah. And she has this online training for free. And it's like, find your eco niche. And uh, I realized that the way I could merge, you know, everything that I was doing and interested in and passionate about was through eco grief or ecological grief, looking at all of the emotions that come with awareness, you know, global awareness, um, which I was teaching to college students and, you know, having experienced my own eco grief, still experiencing my own eco grief, and now working with students who are coming to me and saying, the more I learn in your class and in my other classes, the more angry I am, the more, you know, heartbroken I am. And then at the same time for me, you know, yoga was this, this refuge for me in which it's not an escape, it was a practice in which yoga was a, a place and a practice in which I could feel my feelings. Mm -hmm. It gave me a space to let the emotions move through me. And the more I realize that, the more I have come to be in my body, the more I realize it's a lifelong thing. I will always be moving things through my body that are mine, that are ancestral, that are collective. And yoga being a relational practice, also that's literally what yoga means. Yoga in Sanskrit means to yoke, to unite, to join. So my whole sort of last decade or so, having been looking for relational frameworks, you know, cultural geography, deep ecology, ecofeminism, all these sort of academic -y, but not really. I mean, they're spiritual. These are spiritual frameworks, really, but not necessarily always talked about in that way. Having found these relational frameworks, yoga is a is another relational framework. It's a relational practice. Yeah. And it brings in the body, which which again is what is I think is so missing in in the intellectual and in academic communities where we're doing all this talking and thinking and reading and writing about these things, which is great, but we have to do the work in our body. Emotions live in the body, feelings live in the body. These are messengers. Yeah, I there's a lot more I could say, but uh, yeah. that kind of starts to make the connection. Yeah, a couple of things you said. So these cultural assumptions, right? And just this idea of the mind being separate from the body. One thing that's come up for me is even just thinking about, right, like in science fiction, right? There's this mythology, even a lot of movies about like the next stage of human evolution essentially being this disembodied consciousness, mm -hmm. right? It's like, that's actually progress. Like, like that this is, this body is like a mistake in some way. Yeah. And what I'm hearing for you is that this other, like more expansive worldview, this relational worldview really came from connecting into your body. But I'm just wondering, like, how do you explain the, the relational worldview when you're talking to people who very much have, you know, a Western linear worldview? Right. Yeah. So I found one of the best ways I can introduce that you know, the, these huge topics in like a, you know, digestible way and a really uh, accessible way is through the book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Uh -huh. Have you read this book? It's been a long time, but yeah. Yeah. So it's written in 1992, which is always something that we talk about um, in my class because it's, you know, it, it seems very dated, but it's actually not at all dated. And so Ishmael is basically a, a conversation, the whole novel is a conversation between um, a gorilla and the narrator. And the narrator, ha be having been a person who, when they were younger, had this desire to save the world, but then realized, you know, they didn't really know how to do that or um, what that looked like or what was even really wrong. And then there's this ad in the newspaper that says, looking for a person with a desire to save the world. And this ad was like this trigger for this person, like, and they end up following this ad and meeting Ishmael. And the whole thing is basically this conversation in which Ishmael takes the narrator deeper and deeper into uncovering the assumptions of modern culture, of Western culture, dominant culture, that the narrator had always, you know, had grown up to believe was just the way things are. Yeah. And so it's this like layer by layer uncovering of everything I thought was just fact, was just taken for granted is a story. And it's one story of many stories. And it's a very deeply problematic story. And so basically, the core assumption is that the world was made for man. 
humans, but men in particular, because this is patriarchal. Humans in nature are separate. Yeah. And so with this relational worldview and your background in ecology and environmental studies, and then this element of finding yoga as like this practice to really embody the relationality. And then, so now we have grief, which mm. you've touched upon. Um, I do a lot of grief counseling with people one-on-one. -on -one, and one of the things that I've, I've found that is often not talked about, but really like grief counseling is relationship counseling. It's just like relationship counseling after someone has died. Right. Um, and so it just seems like grief itself really demands a, an opening into relationality, right? Because in grief, it's not really possible to separate from the mind from the body anymore. Mm. I mean, one thing that becomes very clear is even if someone uh, has died, we're still in relationship with them, mm. right? So just, it, it's very much a ancient primal experience. And I'm just wondering, how do you see grief and relational worldview, like how do those sit together for you? And why is grief work in particular so important? Yeah. You know, one thing you just said is that grief is really an embodied experience, right? And most of us can recall a particular, you know, time in which we are, are just hit by fresh grief. And we can know that that is such an embodied experience and as painful as it is, it's doing this amazing work of, of bringing us back into our bodies when we are perhaps very, most of the time disembodied. It reminded me of a, a quote, I know we both uh, share, you know, learning from Francis Weller. Um, and he has this quote that says, you know, grief brings us back into the body and through the body, we can return basically this is a paraphrase, but we can return to the earth. We can mm. return to the world. And I think kind of a side note, but that is one of the most important points to me is that, you know, we can, we can be environmental studies students or, or whatever. We can be activists. We can already care about the world and want to make change. But if we're not in our bodies, if we're living in our, in our minds, then we can't feel the earth. Like uh -huh. Thomas Hubel, a collective trauma person says that he's like, if we're not in our bodies, we can't feel the earth. And if we can't feel the earth, right, if we aren't connected to the earth, then the work that we want to do to make environmental social change is never going to be the depth, get to the radical roots if we aren't literally connected to the earth. That's just one thing. That's just one example I always think about with yoga, you know, asana, mudra, meditation, pranayama, all of these practices, plus, of course, the ethical precepts. Mudra is one, being hand gestures is one way that we can really physically embody, we can come back into our bodies through these practices, and we can embody, for example, our connection to the earth. So Bhu Mudra is a mudra gesture of the earth where you literally connect to the earth. And so just right there, to me, that's really powerful. I can physically come back into my body and connect to the earth, I can plug into the earth. And only from there can I, you know, do any of the deep, slow, intentional work that is needed in these times. If we're not in our bodies and we're in urgency thinking, because that's a very common and understandable response to the urgency of sure. our crises, right? The times are urgent. There's no denying that things are urgent. But if we respond to that urgency with more urgency, again, first of all, when we're in urgency thinking, we're in our sympathetic nervous system, we're in fight or flight, and we're not in our bodies. Um, and really, we're adding to the urgency, we're adding to the chaos, right? So just this radical importance of regulating our nervous systems coming into our bodies, connecting to ourselves, to other people, to the earth, as being like a precursor to anything that we must do in these times really right but well, yeah no it's i think this is a good thread and it leads you know i told you that there's uh a few questions that i i mean these are things that are just very much up for me mm. um and so thinking about this right like 
So it's an urgent situation, but what I'm hearing is it's like urgently demanding that we have a willingness to do this like slower, deeper work. But there's this part of me that wonders. So I am in this Western industrialized world. Really, I have like just anything at my fingertips, right? I can have this like deep conversation about all these things and I can feel my grief. And then right after this, I can go and order a book on Amazon or yeah. right now, you know, one of the things I told you coming into this, like one of the big anxieties I've had, I'm just figuring out is just like, I have some retreats I'm planning, like spiritual retreats, like this place for people to come together and to drop in and to take this break. And, and I see this as like really important needed work, but like also just recognizing that the only way to plan them really is going to involve uh, me flying somewhere, probably other people flying somewhere. And then just thinking about um, at what point is feeling enough? And at what point, like, mm -hmm. what point does this like actually demand some other total rethinking of action? Like, mm -hmm. Honestly, like I feel a lot of confusion about if it's even ethical for me at this point with everything I know to like fly again. Yeah. And obviously, I still want to see, like, my family lives up in Washington State. I just would love to know from where you sit, what does ethical action look mm. like right now? Yeah. So a quote, I um, always think of quotes, I'm just I'm a quote lover. So a quote that just came to me when you were talking was from Reverend Ke uh, Angel Kyoto Williams. And again, a paraphrase, but she says, basically, without interchange no outer change is possible with without outer change no inner change matters right so there's this relationship like we we need to be doing the inner work and knowing that that is not necessarily like insular that's not something that's like shutting out the outer world and saying well i'm just going to do my inner work um I, some people do can do that right and then they're they're sort of bypassing and that's when that second part comes in that you can't just do the inner work all the time right you can't just go and and do restorative yoga and feel your feelings and just stop there though you know that one thing to point out there that that trisha hersey of the nap ministry talks about a lot is that like we also don't want to fall into the trap of saying, I'm just doing this work so that I can like restore myself and then keep going because, you know, rest um, as a radical practice, feeling our emotions, feeling our grief, letting these emotions teach us is real work in itself. So I don't want it to say like, it's only as like a, an, a means to an end because it can be an end in itself, but we also is not only an end in itself, right? So we do we do the inner work and then we let that inner work inform what our activism is, I think. So to me, like what I encounter with a lot of my students and I see that urgency in them when we're learning all these, you know, very, um, again, like this heartbreak, heartbreak of the world, um, what is happening to the world, to the planet, to other beings. And so there's like this urgency response and it's like, like, why are we sitting in a classroom? I get this from students a lot. Like, why are we sitting in a classroom when we need to be out doing something? And you could say the same thing at a yoga studio. Why are we here in this yoga class when we should be out doing something? And that, like, one assumption there is that that's a very limited view of what activism is. Like, if you think of activism just as, like, I've got to be at a march, i got to be yelling and have my protest sign and all of that and rallying, and um, that is definitely activism. But it's one of many kinds of activism, and it's one that, like, for a lot of people, if you're an introvert, if, um, you know, there's a lot of people who say like, I want to be an activist, but I don't, I really feel uncomfortable in like a really crowded space with all these people, you know, this energy. And, and so I, I can't be an activist. That's so limiting to think that that can all be our only form of activism. And so, you know, one thing that I really emphasize in my classes, my yoga practice, my yoga um, offerings and my college classes is you know, can we understand that our heartbreak is our heart's opening? And in that grief, can we understand that grief is love? So my favorite understanding of grief comes from Chris Jordan and uh, the documentary Albatross, which is basically this like 90 minute or so visual meditation on eco grief. Um, 
And he says that grief is the felt experience of love for something we are have lost or are losing or are losing or have lost. So that's really radical point to me too. Like when we're feeling grief, what we're feeling is love. What we're feeling is compassion. What we're feeling is care. Collective grief is this overwhelming thing, but can we let ourselves feel that and tap into that and begin to process that? Octavia uh, Rahim says that grief and joy are sacred twins, right? When we're mm. closing ourselves off to grief, when we feel this pain arising and we don't want to feel that, and that's understandable because it's really heavy and it's really hard. So if we close off to that, we're closing off to joy. We're closing off to love. And so knowing that that is radical work, it is showing us what we love, what we care for, what brings us joy. Then can we let that guide our action? Because only if our action is joyful, like only if what I'm doing, if I'm doing something because of a sense of guilt or shame, or like I have to do this, that's not going to be sustainable. Um, you know, that's just, it's just not, people are going to burn out or they are just going to, this, they're just going to stop because, um, really in order to, to keep in order, order for real radical resilience, we have to be acting from a place of love and joy, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown's book, pleasure activism, all these different people who are talking about this. So, um, that kind of gets me, I guess, to your other point about like flying in particular, um, or just again, like ordering on Amazon and all these things that are, you know, it can make us feel so split, like guilty feeling if we're, we know these things on one hand, on the one hand, but we still have to like get in our car and drive, or maybe I have to, I want to see my parents. So I'm going to fly. Then we can really fall into, and I've done this a lot. We can fall into this trap to an extent of, of just feeling like, paralyzed, right? Guilt and shame, initially they can be like, you know, an important emotion to, to point us somewhere, to show us something that's wrong, something that needs exploration. But if we stay there, it's paralyzing. Because if we're just in guilt and shame, we're like resisting things as they are. Like I want things to be different. I want to not have to get in my car or whatever it is. And we can be really thoughtful about that. Like maybe I don't have to get in my car every single time I think I do, or maybe I can walk, you know, somewhere, ride my bike. But that's also to like, become so deeply immersed in like my own individual changes. Um, and, you know, it's true, be the change you want to see in the world. Like that's a very valuable, you know, cliche thing that we hear a lot. It's true. We, sh we need to live our lives as best we can in the aligned with the values that we have and that we want to see in the world. But that's also like a really convenient narrative for, for example, the 100 corporations that are responsible for 71% of our emissions, mm -hmm. right? That's really convenient for people to, to really take this on ourselves on this individual level when what we need is systemic structural yeah. change. And those things are not separate. Nothing's right. separate. It's like, <laughs> but to me, it comes down to like, for example, the flight, we need to be thoughtful about what we're doing. Um, but it doesn't mean like I have to, you know, I have to like limit myself completely and, and never get in my car and never ever see my parents again, or, you know, retreat planning, for example, it's really about being thoughtful. What am I traveling to do? Where am I going? Just travel in general is such a conundrum too, because it can be so, um, it can shift awareness so deeply for people. It's really important, but it's also a power laden thing to do. Tourism is like uh, the production and consumption of, of place, just like everything else in our world has been commodified. And, you know, so, so thinking thoughtfully about where we're going and what it is we're doing. So really just, I think those are the questions to be asking and like, do I need to fly like five times this year? Probably not, but do I want to, you know, do I need to see my parents and do I want to lead this one retreat that I'm so passionate about and putting my life, you know, my, my life's work sort of into this. Um, yeah. You know, that's how I think about it. Yeah. No, I, you touched upon a lot of beautiful and powerful points. And, um, you know, one with, right again, like looking at these cultural assumptions and one of the reasons why doing this slower, deeper work is so important, right? Is that, um, we start getting in touch with just how fucked up everything seems. And then it's like, I, you know, I got to fix this, right? 
but then allowing that to sit a little bit more. And then you realize that that, that individual like framework that like basically these systemic issues, um, or my individual fault and that my individual personal actions are going to solve them. Yeah. That's, that's like a more shallow response. Right. Yeah. And one thing I've been thinking of is, um, the more I allow myself to really sit in the pain of it, the more I see that the, the reality is, um, as like climate change continues to hit, right. The, the, the people that are going to experience the brunt of it and experience the brunt of it first are the, the people globally and, and culturally and, economically that uh caused it the least mm -hmm. yeah. right so so in sitting in that like that that actually opens up to just different type of messages we can put out there in terms of like climate reparations and i was reflecting on this actually as we were talking and i was realizing that it gets to the core of i think some of my anxiety is that there's also this dynamic of like what story is happening mm -hmm. so I work a lot with people um, either experiencing death, uh, family systems experiencing death, or people just after. And one of the things that's so confusing about the dying process is that it's not often so clear. It's not just like cut and dry, like this person's dying, mm -hmm. um, right? Because the way our medical system's set up, there's often always a chance. And do you have this surgery or this treatment done if there's a 10% chance, you know, like, it's often not as clear as a doctor being able to tell you they're going to die. They need to go on hospice, right? It's, it feels like there's choice. Because of that, when someone does die, it often prevents people from having a longer amount of time to have been able to be in that yeah. dying process with someone, right? Yeah. Mm. But when you're in it, like you, you don't know it because it's not clear. And I think that's one of the things that's confusing for me is not being a, a scientist or a climate scientist sometimes I hear conflicting messages, right? Like sometimes there's like radical people out there that just say like, we, we just have to shut everything down right now. Like the, the, like this is it. And then there's other people that are like, yeah, th there's a certain amount of flights that isn't sustainable and we should be looking at our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. And then this other element of like, in terms of guiding my actions, right? Like is something right now really dying out and that it's important that we're building the skills and things so that we can help in a rebuilding? Um, <clears throat> or is there something that can be saved? Is this really the time to fight for something? And my predominant sense when I hear these different narratives, um, it's just confusion. Like mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't know. And that often makes it difficult to determine right action. Mm. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess in one of these sort of n conflicting narratives you're hearing or that I'm hearing that we're all hearing, you know, I guess would one of them be like, I guess, the more hopeful narrative um, in that like, oh, you know, things are really bad, but there's still, you know, you're always still hearing like we have this much time left now, this much time left now, this much this percentage, whatever. Um, and of course that's getting smaller and smaller, but you still keep hearing that. Um, and then there's like kind of related to that, you hear like the kind of the techno hopeful narrative that like we can basically sure. solve all of this if we just techno fix our way out of it. Right. We don't necessarily have to change the deep roots, the systems themselves, but we have to like change you know, we have to move toward renewable energy, for example. And and that's a good example, maybe in the complexity of it, because yes, we need to be moving toward renewable energy. We need to be moving away from fossil fuels, obviously, like as fast as we can. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, Wendell Berry, who has in one of his books, he says something like, you know, we could wake up tomorrow and we have solar panels on every house and, you know, wind energy and all this thing, we've completely converted to renewable energy. But if we haven't changed our systems, like if we haven't changed, if we haven't moved away from capitalism, right? If we're not, if we're still trying to do capitalism with renewable energy, we might buy ourselves some more time, but we're still going to end up in the same place because, you know, because again, that's, that's not getting to the roots. And the roots being our relationship with how we see ourselves in the world. Capitalism says that the world is is not alive. Like the world is 
something that can be put into production. Um, and so it's just going to buy us more time, but, but the system is just still going to keep doing that, right? It's still going to putting, keep putting the world into production, um, for profit. It's still going to keep putting, you know, our bodies into production for profit. So I think we need to be moving toward renewable energy simultaneously. We need to be getting to the deep roots, never losing sight of those deep roots. Like we can't just do band-aid, um, approaches. And that's why to me, interdisciplinary, what anything I do has needs to be interdisciplinary. Anything, all, any of us do need to be interdisciplinary because if we're putting ourselves in these silos, so oftentimes what, you know, these silos are doing these departments or whatever it is, are, are band-aid fixes. Um, so if we don't have the big picture, if we're not having dialogue and if we're not always returning to those cultural assumptions and understanding that that's a story and that we have to rewrite the story, then it's not going to be the depth of work that we need. Um, and something just came to me. It's really hard for people to imagine moving away from capitalism, yeah. moving away from these systems. Um, and understandably so. We're so steeped in it. We're so socialized in it. It's been centuries. And another book that I love teaching in one of my courses is um, called A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things by okay. Raj Patel and Jason Moore. And it sort of breaks down, um, looks at how capitalism has cheapened everything. Um, it's cheapened lives, it's cheapened nature, it's cheapened work, it's cheapened food. And one quote that they have that I talk that always comes up is that they say is that people can imagine the end of the world before they can imagine the end of capitalism. Mm. And I think that's so true. You know, we just look at you like you mentioned science fiction earlier and so much of our like pop culture or television shows, whatever it, it might be, are around like apocalyptic narratives, like the end of the world. You know, that's something we can like imagine. That's something that people are imagining for us and that we're consuming in these narratives. It's harder for us to imagine systems change, you yeah. know. Um, and one of the things that, that brings me back to another point about eco grief and feeling these emotions and why that's really radical work is understanding emotions as messengers, as feedback, right? So when we're having an emotion, our body is telling us something. Yeah. Our body knows that things are very wrong, right? So when these emotions are coming up, this feedback's coming up and we're closing it off. We're, we're saying that that hurts or I don't know what that is or, and we're pushing it away or we're denying it. And then we're closing off feedback and that feedback we're then closing off to like our ability to even start to, to reimagine and we're closing off to our innate creativity and radical imagination that we all have. So that's another thing, like we're all innately compassionate beings and that's not what our, the dominant culture tells us. The dominant culture tells us that all of this is happening because of human nature, that humans are greedy, that we're self-interested and we're just going to destroy the world. Like, I mean, I heard that growing up all the time, you know, be like talking to even my parents, like what, what's going on? Like, why are people doing this? Why? And, and it's like, well, that's just how people are. Yeah. And that's one of the like core things we talk about in my classes is like, if we have that narrative that this is human nature, then it's human nature, then it's going to run its course. Yeah. And my dad will, will say, would say that to me all the time growing up, like, yeah, you know, we're going to basically destroy the world, but luckily I won't be here for it. And, you know, and it's happening faster than he thought. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, it, that's really beautifully said. Um, and I guess it leads me to just a final question that could maybe wrap this up before we could talk a little bit more just about just specifically some of the work you do and offer. Because um, even this idea, right, of envisioning a post-capitalist future, um, even then there's like different narratives, right? If, if you think about like market Marxism and anarchism, they both have the same vision of a future, but um, very different praxis, right? Different visions of how we get there versus, you know, decolonization and indigenization. And, mm -hmm. and I don't expect you to answer that question for me, but I'm just curious for you. I mean, it's very clear that the, the, the framework that you see, the way that your imagination is working for envisioning this future, um, where do you sit in this spectrum of, of praxis? Like how, how do we get from here to there and what, what guides your, your work? So, you know, one thing that just, I was thinking about when you were just talking is, you know, where do we start with all this, this massive reimagination? Um, I have 
in one of my classes, I've had people at the end of the semester write like a post-capitalist manifesto and they actually start to imagine like what are the values that we need to bring into this post-capitalist world. Um, and it's really beautiful. I, I like hung, I grabbed, I gathered all of the pieces up together and formed it into one like big manifesto and published that online um, somewhere still out there. But, um, you know, so connecting with other people and like having these conversations, doing this work, this like unlearning, relearning work, which is a constant, you know, process. I'm still doing it. We're all going to still be doing it forever. Right. That's one thing too. like a side note is taking the long view here, mm -hmm. which is hard to do when again, everything's so urgent. Yeah. Um, because I used to always kind of get myself into that. Like, again, like even knowing in an intellectual way, all the stuff I'm talking about, it's still like, I'm, I'm so destination oriented and I'm looking for the change right away. And like, we, I wish we would have that change right away. I wish we'd wake up and the world would be different tomorrow, but yeah. it's going to be a lifetime's work and beyond that. And like you said, I remember you said in the eco grief circle, like it's just a given that there's going to be suffering. There is already suffering. There yeah. has been suffering. It's going to continue. Um, so we have to, that's, we're going to have to keep processing that, you know, we're going to yeah. have to keep processing that and knowing that that's the world we're going to live in. But still, I'm still, you know, not losing sight of of reimagining, doing the work to reimagine and to put that reimagination into, you know, into the world. And so one thing just kind of as a as a geographer, I, I think about a lot about place and landscape and how like we can read the values of a dominant culture, for example, in our landscape. Just as a random example is the lawn, the mm -hmm. lawn, the green monoculture, perfect lawn in American. It's kind of like equivalent with the American dream. You you get the perfect house and you have the perfect green grass. Of course, what does it take to get that green grass? It's the killing of biodiversity. It's spraying chemicals, um, toxic chemicals on the earth. It's you know, killing all the insects and the plants and the animals. It, it's kind of like a microcosm of, of um, you know, our larger problems. I like to do that too. break it down because everything's so big and overwhelming. Like, let me just look at a lawn and see like this lawn embodies all the problems and the problematic assumptions and the systems. And how can I also reimagine this space? Mm -hmm. So like permaculture, for example, as being another relational framework and just, you know, food sovereignty and indigenous food systems and different things in general. But how do we reimagine re like our home spaces, our yard spaces, our neighborhoods, like starting at these smaller scales. Like, how do I reimagine these spaces with like an ecocentric worldview rather than an anthropocentric worldview? This this space is not for me. This yeah. is not my land. I do not own it, right? Um, just land ownership in general. Again, all of these things being um, all coming from this assumption that the world is for for us, the world is for people, and not just for all, not for all people, right? For a particular group of privileged people. Yeah, this is beautifully said, um, and actually, it stretched my mind hearing you say that because one thing um, I'm in the process. It's like my own life goals is to build a buy a home in the next year, and it's so that I can live more in alignment with my values. But then that also has just made me think more realistically about just how much privilege there is in that. Mm -hmm, and yeah. what I heard in you sharing that also was just, it's even like a deeper reimagining of like, is it possible to imagine a future where people have a place to live and they're able to be stewards, but we, we don't have this idea of land ownership anymore, right? What I think that you saying that left me with is just this idea that uh, with this deeper work, um, a, the big part of it is also just allowing our imagination to get more expansive. Yeah. Um, this has been a super rich discussion. We're, we're getting close to about an hour. And so I'd like just to turn to the work that you do both here locally and then also online so that people are interested in any of this. And if they want to explore this and find ways where their own spiritual practices, their own yoga practices can, can deepen their own relationship with grief and with systemic issues, um, yeah. How, how can they connect with you and what is it that, that you offer in that realm? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so my local offerings, I have um, a couple of different local offerings here in Humboldt County and then also an online self-paced online course called Yoga for Ecological Grief. When COVID happened and everything kind of moved online, I developed an online course through 
the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Cal Poly Humboldt, which is like extended ed. I developed yoga for eco grief, grief through that. Um, so uh -huh. I offered that a few times. And then I decided I wanted to make that an online course accessible to anyone, self-paced, asynchronous course. There's lectures in which I get into all of this, like talking about grief and then eco grief and then yoga and um, as a relational somatic embodied practice and framework and how all this connects. There are actual guided yoga classes that are um, yen and restorative, meaning slow again. So like allowing us to embody slowness mm -hmm. and a rest as um, these radical practices being closer to the earth. So the practice is all seated and lying down. Um, there's lots of um, options. I have also a, a training in the trauma conscious yoga method. So it's all trauma conscious and like every, every class in the whole course in general is meant to be sort of a trauma conscious container. When we're talking about eco grief and, um, you know, working with these emotions, ultimately one of the goals of this kind of practice is to keep our heart open rather than closing it off because mm -hmm. that's what we want to do. You know, when, when, everything feels so heavy and overwhelming yeah. and immense. We want to go like this and we want, we want to, you know, turn inward and close off our heart and stay like that. And one thing that I really talk about a lot that I think is so important um, that yoga allows us to embody is we don't, we actually, I want to honor that. I want to honor that my body, that my mind, that my heart, everything is, is because that's so painful and so heavy. Like I want to turn inward and so can I do that? Like, can I find, for example, a yoga asana? Can I find a restorative child's pose or wisdom pose? And can I physically turn inward with all the support, like a bolster and blankets and all these things? And can I turn inward and support my heart? Because it's hurting, right? It's really hurting. And I need yeah. to to turn in and, and offer it nourishment and realize that there's a ground beneath me, right? When we're overwhelmed, we feel groundless. And so that's kind of what the idea of each trauma conscious container is, um, is that we always, all this work has to come from a grounded place. Like we have to first regulate our nervous systems, get into our bodies, feel safe. Because if ultimately our goal is to move from contraction to expansion, to keeping our hearts open, you know, to doing the, the extroverted work, to doing the work in the world, um, then we have to start by honoring that contraction because everything is always contracting and expanding. I've been in too many yoga classes where you jump into like a faster paced yoga class and the teacher's just like, open the heart right from the start. It's like, open the heart. And if I'm, you know, grieving or if I am, you know, experiencing PTSD or whatever it might be, which so many of us are, it doesn't feel safe to just open my heart. That's so vulnerable, yeah. right? To get into a heart opening pose. Um, that's just something that's so important to me and my restorative um, personal, you know, private offerings with people um, and this course and just anything in general, everything in general. I, I try to always embody cycles. Like we're always contracting and expanding. We don't just need to live in an expanded place all the time. We right. can't just have our hearts open all the time. We don't want to just watch the news all the time. We don't want to be like, I can't close off to this. So I'm just going to constantly watch the news, you know, and people feel guilty. That's another thing people feel guilty about is, is like, I have to be tuned in all the time because if mm. I don't, then I'm like shutting it out. And I think you've got to have a balance. Everything's right. about titration, moving toward the work and away from the work to honor yourself and to take care of yourself um, too, to not burn out. So there's yoga for eco grief online course. And then um, just in 2021, I, um, I found a little healing space, private space in Old Town Eureka. And so I'm calling it uh, a restful space. And that is sort of um, the umbrella in which I'm putting my, my private restorative offerings with folks, all with the intention of, of balance, of grounding, of regulation, um, nervous system regulation really being, being key. But um, and then I've been offering these yoga for, or, or these community rest and eco grief circles also, which is what you mentioned before. Yeah. So those are monthly offerings, um, at Om Shala Yoga and putting community rest and eco grief together, um, inviting people to come in and share in the super vulnerable way. Yeah. Um, again, I have to create a container in which people can feel safe enough to do that. And restorative yoga is a way that I can do that. So kind of intertwining restorative yoga, you know, breathe through that and feel through that together because grief was never meant to be a private thing. Right. 
it's so much a private thing in our in our culture, the yeah. dominant culture. So just grieving together, coming together and feeling and sharing is radical work too. And I think it's so important. Um, so yeah, those are my three offerings. And you can go to a restful space.com or um, on Instagram as a restful space. And I can share links with you and for anyone who's interested in looking into that. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just really grateful that you came to talk with me and this has been really fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful too for the invitation and for all the work that you do also. Awesome.